the cross. Once simply an instrument of violence and death, the cross has come to symbolize the ultimate expression of God's love for the world. While the cross has become commonplace in our culture, what does it really mean that Christ died for us? And how is it the message of the cross, regarded as foolishness to the world, reveals the true wisdom and power of God for our salvation? What happened on that cross 2,000 years ago, and why does it matter to any of us today? Good morning, church. Uh, today we have a couple different passages uh, that Pastor Kurt's going to preach from, starting in Philippians. Um, there it'll be uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 12. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And then we're going to jump to Second Peter. First Peter, um, chapter 2, verses 20 through 24. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that, free from sins, he might live for righteousness. Being by his wounds, you have been healed. Thanks, Amanda. I'm not going to lie, i got a little Worship Wednesday going in me. A little adrenaline going right now. Uh, I'm going to talk fast, apparently. Sorry. Uh, let's, uh, let's pray together. God, we give you thanks for this day. Uh, we give you thanks for the chance to lift up our, our voices together, to lift up our hands, to lift up all of who we are to you in praise. You alone are worthy of that. God, we give you thanks for gathering us. We give you thanks for your word that we can gather and hear it declared, hear it read, hear it shared as Amanda just did for us. God, would would you do something in us that that we might be open to receive your word today? We know that it is alive, that it is working by your Holy Spirit in us even this day. God, would it be so this morning by your Holy Spirit? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let me say first, yes, it is Palm Sunday. And no, that was not the normal Palm Sunday text that we might imagine hearing together on Palm Sunday. Maybe not the text you expected this morning. Uh, Part of that is because if you've been with us, you know that we've been in the middle of this sermon series uh, called The Wondrous Cross, where we're looking at the, the various historical pictures of the cross and what the church has held the cross to mean over the course of the church history, 
uh, so that we might understand what the cross means for us today. And today, Palm Sunday actually is a great fit for our vision of the cross today. And what we're going to look at is the cross as moral example. The cross as moral example. Now on Palm Sunday, Jesus gives a glimpse of who he is when he rides into the city as the king of kings, not on this amazing, beautiful war horse, not in this opulent chariot, but on this borrowed donkey. So certainly on Palm Sunday, we can look to Jesus as an example. We can look to this entry as an example. When we think about moral example, this is certainly one picture of that in the life of Jesus. But Palm Sunday is not the cross. Spoiler alert, that's Good Friday. Hang with us this week. We're getting there. And, and while Jesus certainly gives us a picture of moral example to live by on Palm Sunday, there is a subtle difference between that picture and the picture of the cross. So we're going to look at that a little bit today. But before we do that, I, I want to just name uh, honestly, that, that these words cross as moral example, it makes me feel something. I don't, I don't know, maybe it makes you feel something, maybe it doesn't, but here's what it makes me feel. It puts me back into my 90s youth group. Yes, I'm a kid of the 90s. Uh, puts me back into my 90s youth group and 90s Sunday school. The, the 90s was a different time, and I'm not talking just because we wore spandex with neon stripes. Come on, raise your hand. Yep, come on. That's not what I mean by the 90s was a different time. The church in the 90s and the 80s into the 90s, the church was different. Christian education was a little different. Uh, maybe you had a similar, similar experience to mine, but there was a movement in the 90s where prominent church leaders uh, would think about Christian education as simply modifying behavior. Right, that, that if, if youth groups and students could simply just do the right things and make the right choices, this would make them good, healthy Christians. Maybe even as we look back now, uh, prominent church leaders today would say that maybe in that time frame, the church focused more on right behaviors, even so than life transformation. So when I hear moral example. I connect these words with some of my background that says, if I just match my behavior to what God wants, God will be pleased with me. Versus allowing God, inviting God to change my heart, right? You see the difference there? Uh, one might say that a change of heart will always lead to behaviors, but behaviors will rarely lead to a change of heart. Again, maybe you had a similar experience, maybe you didn't. Maybe you remember some of those uh, moments where maybe someone told you, if you just don't drink or smoke or curse, God will be happy with you, and that will make you a good Christian. Maybe that wasn't your experience, and that's okay. Here's really what I think of when I think about moral example. It's this. It's this picture. Uh, it's these bracelets. And, and I want to say, if you're wearing one today, this is not bad. I promise you, this is not bad. But this is what I think of when I hear the words moral example. Again, these are not bad. Don't throw them away if you have one on. But I do want to say maybe there's some nuance that I want to add to this. I don't know how many letters. I should have, like, lettered this out and see if there was enough bracelet even to do this. Ah, I missed an opportunity. Uh, but here's what I want to propose. Here's the nuance. Here's the nuance that I want to propose. Here's the question. Instead of what would Jesus do, how would Jesus live my life if Jesus was living my life? Right? How would Jesus live my life if Jesus was living my life? It's nuanced, but it's different. I think this, this little subtle nuance is what helps keep this moral example from being a, a legalistic mindset that says, if I just make the right choice, that makes me a good Christian. I love this language. This is not mine. I stole this from a friend who I think stole it from a friend. Lots of people say something like this. It's not mine, but I love the language. And here's why. We often think of Jesus on the cross as our default of Jesus, right? 
But remember, Jesus, in fact, is living today and did, in fact, live a life, a life not unlike mine and not unlike yours. I would imagine he probably spent a little less time on Instagram than I do, but not unlike my life or yours. Jesus uh, lived a human life with human emotions, feeling human things, a same experience of being a human that, that we have Today. And not only did Jesus live that human experience, he lived it perfectly. He gives us this perfect example of a flourishing life. And not just in like the first 30 years of his life, but also even in his life as he led up to the cross, as he was led up to the cross. So I want to assert to us today, assert to you today, that the cross as moral example is about so much more than simply living life, making the right choices, being a good person or a nice person or doing the right things versus the wrong things. I want to propose that the cross as moral example actually means living a life as an apprentice of Jesus. Living life as an apprentice of Jesus. Now, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, so let's slow down. Let's think specifically a little bit about Jesus and the cross as moral example, at least how Paul gives us in Philippians. If you noticed, Paul started his uh, passage with this. He started this part of chapter 2 like this. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Let the same mindset be in you that was in Christ Jesus. There's a couple things that are important about this. Have you ever wondered what, who the you is? It's not you like Micah or uh, Sarah. It's you like the church, right? It's not an individual you. It's not just you as a person. It's you collectively. You, the church, let the same mindset be in you. Uh, there's a New Testament scholar named Michael Gorman who would paraphrase it like this. He would say, have the mindset of Jesus in your community, right? Have the mindset of Jesus in your community because your community is indeed a community of Christ. Maybe then the next question, maybe you're wondering, what is the mindset of Jesus? (laughs) What is the mindset of Jesus that we're supposed to follow? Paul tells us that too. I'm going to read this again. This Part of Philippians is called the Christ hymn of Philippians, if if you're familiar. This is just a paramount piece of the New Testament of Christology, so I'm going to read it again. I don't think we can overhear this. Uh, Paul tells us what the mindset is in verses 6 through 11. He says, Who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something exploited, but Self, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." Did you see the pattern there? This is a posture and a pattern. This mindset is a a pattern of descent followed by ascent, right? Did you catch it? That's what Paul wrote here. And let's pause and just name how absurd this is that we're even saying the word descent. We're talking about the God of the universe here who emptied himself to take the position of a slave I want to make sure that we know this is not metaphor. This is not hyperbole. Right? This is not wordplay. This is not literary critique. This is literally a posture that Jesus, God in the flesh, assumes that is complete and full self sacrifice. Complete and full self giving for the sake of of the world. This cannot be overstated. And not only that, Jesus took human form, felt human things, felt human pain, all so that he might be humiliated on a cross. 
Remember, on, on week one, we talked about this idea of the cross, this Roman torture device, right? Almost as important to this being a tool, almost as important as the pain and the dying was the humiliation, right? Almost as important to this being a, a, a tool of torture was how humiliating it would be to be on a cross. Jesus took on flesh only to, to lead up to that complete and utter humiliation. Again, friends, this, this is not a metaphor. When, when, when I say utter humiliation, this is not hyperbole. This is Jesus, God in the flesh, seeing his part, his membership as one member of the Trinity, as something that's, that's not worth holding on to to avoid those things for you and me, for the world. Paul says, church, have that same mindset. Whoa. Like, really, Paul? <laughs> Are you sure? Are you sure? Uh, obedience to death, self-giving, self-sacrificing love for the sake of of the kingdom of God for the sake of others. Let this same mindset be in you. Now, I know it's, it's Holy Week and we're gonna get to this part, um, but that's the descent part. There's also the ascent part, right? We can't forget the uh, ascent of this. When we think about imitating the life of Jesus or wondering how Jesus would live our life if he was living our life, we can't forget that just as we suffer and die and are obedient even to, to the cross. Even as we imitate that, by the Holy Spirit, we imitate the ascent as well. Romans 6, 8 says, if we've died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. That's coming in Holy Week. We'll get there. But I want to jump now to 1 Peter 2. Um, 1 Peter also. <laughs> uh, because there's something really important here as well. Um, I want to, I want to read just the, the first little part of this again. Maybe. Verse twenty one says this: For this you, to you, have, for this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you should follow in His steps. This word example is super cool. And super cool in a, in a way that helps us understand that sometimes our English Bibles just don't capture all the, all, all the richness. This word in Greek captures an idea, captures a process. This word actually refers to a way that the Greeks would teach their kids how to write, how to, how to learn the Greek alphabet. The, the Greek people uh, would, would have a, a tool like this. This is obviously a modern version of this, but they would have some sort of surface where the letters were on the surface, and they, they would have their kids literally trace the letters over and over and over and over and over, like building muscle memory until they figured it out, until they had the letters. I, I don't imagine there's probably any paper or parchment or anything like we think of tracing now, but you get the muscle memory piece, right? Over and over and over. Think about how effective this would be. I, I don't know about you, but when, when, when our kids were learning how to write, and it feels like a long time ago, maybe there's something different. They had paper like this um, that had like the dotted lines, right? And you trace one, but then you write the letters next to it. Yeah. <laughs> yep, I see some heads shaking out there. Now, now of course, Amber and I's kids learned how to write, learned how to make letters here, but they were not learning how to make copies, they were learning how to write. This is why all of our handwriting looks a little bit different. And if you opened up some old Greek manuscripts, you'd probably see some very similar writing because we taught our kids a little differently than the Greeks. Think about how much better Amber and I's kids would have like direct copies of this if they just traced it over and over and over and over. So I think the, the most literal term, the most literal way to think about example as, for, as Peter writes, the most literal way to think about this is the example is the closest of copies. 
Jesus gives us his life, shows us this moral example through the cross so that our lives might be the closest of copies. Just like those Greek letters, over and over and over, that our lives might be the closest of copies. I just, I like that phrase when we think about Jesus and discipleship. Because in Jesus' is suffering, and not just suffering, right? Again, we often jump straight to Good Friday and think about Jesus' suffering, but Jesus' life as it, as it led to suffering, Jesus, the way he lived leading to the cross, I, I think is just a beautiful example that shows us how our lives might become the closest of copies to the life of Jesus. And we're going to remember that this week, right? It is Holy Week. We're going to remember all of these things. We're going to remember that Jesus was unjustly arrested. That Jesus was unjustly mocked and beaten. We're going to remember that Jesus allowed those same people to literally crucify him. And he didn't even so much as speak up to defend himself. Right? Instead of, instead of calling on angels to come to his defense, he, he prays for his captors. He says, God, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Instead of causing the heavens to crash down on his enemies and causing him to go free, he allows this horror to happen to him so that, as Peter says, that he might bear the sins in his body on the cross so that free from sins we might live for righteousness. Friends, the cross is an example of, a, of what it means to follow Jesus with all of our lives. This is the cross as moral example. There's a New Testament scholar, her name is Karen Jobes. I might be saying that name wrong. Um, if I am, if you know that, you can correct me. But she says this about the cross as an example for us today. She says, For one cannot step into the footsteps of Jesus and head off into any other direction than the one that he took. And his footsteps lead to the cross, through the grave, and onward to glory. Do you see it? Do you see the point that Karen Jobs is trying to make? Jesus is not just a moral example. The cross is not just a moral example for the church, for us. Jesus and the cross is the moral example. Jesus and the cross, this is the set of letters that we trace. The call then, the invitation, is that we, the church, live nothing less than a cruciform life, a life that looks like Jesus' life. So then, let's go back to the first question that we, act, that we asked at the very beginning. How would Jesus live my life? How would Jesus live your life if Jesus was living our life. Now, I don't know about you, but it can be tempting to answer that many different ways. It can be tempting to say things like, you know, well, if Jesus was living my life, he wouldn't cheat on his taxes, or he wouldn't steal something from his employer, or he wouldn't gossip about his neighbor. And yes, those things are certainly true, <laughs> those things are true. But I wonder if those are the byproducts of a cruciform life, but not the cruciform life itself. When I think about Jesus and the cross being the letters that I trace, the letters that we trace, it, here are some things I think about. I think about Jesus throughout his life taking time to be alone and away with God the Father to be in silence and solitude, to be a way to, to know, to be, to be told, to receive from God his identity, his call, his purpose. 
even to the point of disappointing lots and lots of people around him that wanted him to do different things. I think about this. I think of a, a life that, that was lived in such a way that gave up power and gave up control. I think about a life that resists, resists this posture of defense, resists this posture of fighting. I, th- I think of a life lived seeking faithfulness more than success. The church, and when I say the church, like the church, has held this view of the cross for, for centuries, right? Church history is beautiful. If, if, you don't, if you don't know a lot about church history, it's worth a deep dive. It's amazing. And, and what's been true throughout all of history, the church history, is that the church has wondered what all of this means, right? The church has wondered, so what? What does all of this mean? And what's also true, as long as theologians and the church have wondered this, they've disagreed about this. <laughs> surprise, surprise. But here's the one thing that, that the church over history would agree on, that would say unanimously together, theologians over history would say that if the cross is moral example, then what's paramount for the church is that the church use that moral example to respond to the things of the time. That the church would use the cross as moral example to, d- to respond to the things of this season, right? I-, I wonder what the things of our time are. I, I wonder what the things of this season are. It could be a lot of things. Maybe the time, uh, uh, the things of this season for you maybe are broken relationships. Maybe sickness or loss. Maybe the things of our time look like division or defense or fighting. We're heading into a season where we get to try this on for ourselves, right? Right? This fall, we get to try all of this on together. I don't know what it is for you. I don't know what the thing of this season is for you. I think we would all name the things of our time. I think we could name a, a number of them. But here's, here's my hope. Here's my hope in all of this, that, that we would remember that the cross as moral example is not just a philosophical understanding of the cross. That the cross as moral example is not just an academic understanding of who Jesus is and what happened on the cross. Rather, I hope and pray that our understanding of the cross as moral example is one that leads us to action. Now, Maybe you're like, holy smokes, that sounds terrifying. Yeah, kind of. And and maybe you're like, wait a minute, didn't we just start at the beginning of this saying that this isn't about just doing the right thing or the wrong thing? Yeah, yep, that's true. And here's what makes that true. Here's what makes this not that. We can't do this on our own. We can't live out the cross as moral example On our own. This is the point of this season of Holy Week of the cross. This is the whole point of the cross is that we can't do this on our own. We can only do this as we are equipped and empowered by the Holy Spirit to do so. So that's my hope for us that we wouldn't understand the cross as moral example and leave this place and just make sure we do the right things, but that we would leave this place trusting that the Holy Spirit is doing something in us that leads us to go, to be sent from this place. And here's how I want to leave us then. These are the words of Hebrew, from Hebrews 13. Now may the God of peace 
equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him. May that be so. May that be so for you. May that be so for us. May the Holy Spirit give us courage and grace and awareness and all of those things that we need to follow Jesus' footsteps, the ones that lead to the cross, trusting that they also lead to glory. And may all of this be so in our own lives, our lives together, for the sake of our communities, Hospers, Sioux County, and our world. May it be so. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let's pray. God, we give you thanks for your son Jesus, for the example that we get to see in the cross, the example of humility, the example of self-sacrificing love, for all of the ways that we get to see this, this week, and we get to see Jesus walk up to the cross and all of that means for our lives. God, would you give us the courage to self-examine this week? Would you give us the courage to notice the places where maybe you're nudging us? to be curious about this question of how Jesus, how you, Jesus, would live our lives if you were living our lives. Give us the courage to reflect uh, boldly, trusting that in all of these reflections, you are present, you're delighted, and that you love us deeply. May it be so. In Jesus' name, amen.